Good morning. Hello. I am Lisa Colucci. I'm one of the life coaches at queenbeing.com, where we help you to discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. Hello, fashion family, Karina and Vicky. Hello, hello. Um, so we're going to get started today. Uh, how was your weekend? I'm sorry I was not here yesterday. It was it got crazy. <laughs> so I didn't do it. But we're going to do the topic I was going to do yesterday, today, I had somebody ask for this specifically. Um, so if anyone has anything they want to add to it, please feel free to just chatting about it. The topic is narcissistic mothers and their narcissistic sons. What does that look like when you are in a relationship with a narcissistic son? I suppose it could be daughter too, but this was specifically asked about this specific situation. So Instead of generalizing, I just kind of narrowed it, but I suppose it could be applied to narcissistic mothers and narcissistic daughters. Narcissistic parent, mothers in particular, and their toxic offspring, and you. Okay, so how let's get going with that. If anyone has any help that they need, or they're seeking information, or... Um, your support or anything like that, head over to queenbeing.com where we have all kinds of information and all kinds of stuff to help you out. If you would like text notification of my going live, text me at 33222, put the word lease live, L-I-S-E-L-I-V-E, -E, hit send, and I will text you 10 minutes or so prior to every live stream. If you've not already done so, hit subscribe. It's right there. Super easy hit subscribe, hit the thumbs up, all the good stuff. Okay, um, and if you uh, need coaching help, I'm over at queenbeing.com as well. If you want group coaching help, check out the information in the main description of every video. It's all right there. Okay, so at least it should be. I better check that. <laughs> I will make sure it's there today. All right, so narcissistic moms and narcissistic offspring, okay? kind of different than when you have a narcissistic mom and a survivor offspring, right? When you have, when, when you are the survivor of a narcissistic parent, when, and you're not a narcissist, right? You're a person who's trying to heal from their abuse, perhaps you're codependent, or that's a label that you have uh, um, chosen to use to see the way your traits affect your life because of the abuse and because of the programming totally different than when you have another narcissist in play. So how do I want to start this? Narcissistic mothers, we know that there is like an enormous amount of control that comes from a mom in particular, right? I mean, every mom has the matriarchy of the family, right? We, we carry the, we carry the emotional, the emotional um, support of a family often right? Not always, but mothers, the mothering role is a nurturing, caring, traditionally or idyllically. Um, ideally, we see moms as the caregiving, nurturing, you know, always there for us type. When you have a narcissistic mom, that's not the case. So we all, anyone who's had one knows this, you end up with all of the things you should have not being there. And you have a cold, stony, controlling, um, manipulative, woman as the role that should be the one to nurture you. So what, you know, we know what it, we can talk about another time, what that does for the survivor who is not narcissistic, but what does that do to a narcissist when it creates a narcissist, when it's part of the reason that the, nar again, with the hair and the, okay, the girls are curls. Okay. I'm going to wear ponytails. All right. Um, was it due to a person who is low empathy to begin with? I mean, we don't know what causes narcissism. We know that certain things can contribute to the um, creation of narcissism in someone with low empathy to begin with, right? But we don't know what causes it to begin with. There are people born with less empathy, apparently, <laughs> you know, and you can have two children in the same household treated the same. One can become a narcissist. The other one isn't. Why? Why? We don't. I don't know. Okay. Not going to talk about that. What I want to talk about is the ones that we know become narcissists. So um, the, the power play of a mom like that creates what? It creates what in anyone? 
in anyone. It creates a need to feel like you have some control in your own life. It creates a need to feel like you have some power It feel in your own life because you're not given the tools to show you that you have that you already have those things naturally and that they're good things. We do. We have to, you know, codependent types do it through people pleasing in order to grasp and have some control of their life to make people like them. We do things for them. Right. To to create a safe place for us. We're giving to other people. And that's in a sense, kind of like helping us have a little bit of control over something we have no control over, right? Um, but with a narcissist, what's it going to do? It's going to create more of the narcissistic behaviors because it's they're, they're modeling after what the narcissist does. So I see mom do these things, I do these things. But then the problem is they're still under the control. So it's like having two narcissists in a room. One is always more powerful. You cannot have two that I don't think that are in, of equal well, they don't believe in equal, right? So one will take the role of the lesser, but they'll be like the henchman, right? For that narcissist. So they'll do their bidding. They'll do what they want. They'll they'll look like people pleasers toward their narcissistic mom, but really with everyone else, they're spewing and projecting and manipulating everybody else around them. But with the mom, it looks like, uh, it looks like a codependent people pleaser often. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm going to read what you guys are saying and stop the ramble for a minute. <laughs> That's exactly me. You're not a narcissist though, my friend. So you had the, you had the upbringing, but not the, um, but not the effect of you becoming, losing your empathy. You have high empathy. So a little different here. And what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about today, specifically, somebody asked about um, their partner, their, their narcissistic partner, and their, that, that partner's relationship to their mother and how everything got worse when the mother was around, how, well, undermining of the adult partner relationship. In other words, it looked at that point, once the mother's around, it's like the narcissist is in a relationship with their mother and you are second fiddle, third fiddle, you're way down the line. It's everything goes toward all the energy, all the, all the focus goes towards that narcissistic mother. And then you and then you get the backlash of the devaluing and the um, being torn down. Okay, um, triangulation. There's perpetual triangulation going on between the survivor, the narcissistic partner, and the narcissistic partner's mother. Is a constant triangulation. There's always something feeding back to the narcissistic mother. It's like she holds the power of the whole thing, and at the same time, the narcissist then holds the power of the relationship they're in with the survivors. So, and then that survivor is triangulated into their relationship instead of it being about you two and mom's over here and then, you know, and healthy. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's all intertwined and it's all triangulated. Um, there's an extreme amount of enmeshment that goes on with the narcissistic mother and the narcissistic uh, child that is beyond that of what it is with a codependent. It's a different, it has a different look where it's, <sighs> you can hear the no empathy when they talk about their parent. You can, you can hear it that they are a narcissist as well, but then they go in and they play the, I don't know, the only way I could see it is sort of that Eddie Haskell, leave it to beaver kind of character where they're, you know, totally, kissing the butt of every, you know, their narcissistic parent, and then being a totally two-faced duplicitous person on the other side to their partner. So, okay. Um, they ha Let's see. Oh my God. They have each other's back to the end. Yes. And then there's that. So when they are in the golden child mode, because oftentimes with the adult narcissist, and the narcissistic mother, actually with any adult child and a narcissistic parent, the golden child role doesn't always um, stick. Like they may have their golden child and it usually is, often is the narcissistic child, but not always, not always, um, it can be. And when it is, sometimes they will punish that golden child in the same ways that that golden child narcissist is punishing you in the same manipulative. So they're doing the same tactics, the same communication skills, this or the lack of skills, the same um, relationship style 
that the narcissist uses on you, they're getting used on them by their narcissistic parent. And the golden child is just kept up on the pedestal for a long time, right? So it's kept up in that idealization mode because the narcissist is living through that golden child to prove how great they are. See how great my son is or daughter, you know, look, look at this wonderful, oh, they're the best. They can do no wrong. How dare anyone, you know, they protect, they sweep away any bad things that they're doing and like redirect and do exactly as Vicky's saying, they come after you and make you look like the bad one against their perfect son. And then all of a sudden they might do something. The narcissist might do something or the, or the narcissistic mother may just get in a mood and she'll devalue that golden child. Then often what happens is that golden child will come running to the survivor, tail between the legs and puppy dog eyes, or they can get highly aggressive from the narc injury. You know, there's different ways off. I've heard more people than not say that they come suddenly that's like, it's like they're back. Suddenly it's like they're back and they're begging and they're so sweet and they're, you know, all this. It's like a, like, it's like a, they have nowhere else to go. So they come running like a cockroach back to another source of supply. And yeah, so that, but then all that I'll do is the tables will turn as soon as the narcissistic mother decides to elevate that narcissistic child back up onto the pedestal that they rightfully belong on. And then back you go again into the pit of devalue. So it's a Nikki cycle, right? Okay. Hi, Belle and Mo Cowboy and Phoenix and DC Guy and Darla and Angela. Hello, hello. And Bonnie. Hello. I just found out my dear cat has, oh no, I'm sorry. Poor kitty. Belle says, she used to grab me so hard and pull me around the house that there would be four fingernails where blood would be dripping. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Narcissistic mothers. Uh-huh. Hi, Shastina. I didn't see you there. Um, Darla says he totally, he was no longer in a relationship with me. He was in a relationship with his mom now. Only narcissistic behavior I'd seen was he was in very unempathic and selfish when it came to reciprocation. Right, because he didn't have need to probably, probably, you know, we don't know. The, the cycle of when they begin to devalue can change for every narcissistic relationship. It can be right away, but often there's, it can be, they can keep the mask on for a while and then something tips it. And this is what tipped it in your case. <laughs> so you saw the full force of who he is. Um my dear, my dear mother does love triangulation and division in her family. It is sick. Yep. Uh, ew, yes, says Mo Cowboy, Mommy Narc, Baby Narc, become one in their feeding methodology when together. Yes, they do. Okay. Um, Darla is saying, I often wonder if his anger he was feeling toward her was being directed at me. Yes, it was. Because that's what they do. They don't handle situations. They shove anything that they need to deal with behind exposure of emotion, right? Behind the exposure of authenticity, behind, behind, behind. They shove it all back and then it comes out as projection toward other people. It's classic. And everybody does it a little tiny bit when we don't want to cope with something. And then like, maybe you're having a bad day and you don't, you're just like, oh, I'm so and you're trying to hold it back and you're trying to hold it back. You're trying to hold it back and then somebody like a kid of yours or somebody just is just annoying. <laughs> and instead of saying, oh, come on, you say, stop it. <laughs> right. And you bark at someone it happens to everybody. But the narcissist, that's their mode of communicating. So it happens all the time with them. Um, so, yes, you were exactly getting the anger he was feeling toward her being directed at you. And Angela's saying, my ex had bad behavior to me, escalated. My ex's bad behavior to me escalated after his mother died. Once the need, the act as golden boy left, he dropped the mask. You see? Yes. He knew how he was underneath. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. He had no one left to pretend for. Off came the mask. And there was the true, uh, whatever he felt like doing right? The lack of personality. 
All right. Mo Cowboy says, Amen, Mommy Narc will plot and sabotage anything and everything in the attempt so the baby narcissist can be perceived as the hero. Oh yeah. Until until it crosses a line or they're frustrated with someone else and they need to project onto that baby narcissist. And uh yeah. And then they and then they, you know, pull the rug out from under the pedestal, knock them down a notch. But by knocking them down a notch, it makes them grovel. It, they grovel to their supply. They don't grovel to mommy, but that's okay because then mommy has someone to pull the narcissist away from. In other words, it gives her more power. If she knocks you down, if she knocks down that golden child a little bit and, the, and that golden child goes running tail between the legs to their supply and is all buddy-buddy bonded up with their supply close and snugly again, it's perfect place to steal it back. And think of the supply that gives mommy narc, right? So it's a sick, sick, sick dance. It's very unhealthy. All right. Um, I couldn't say anything about her or the situation and he would cut me off. Right, because they have no accountability, no ability to look at a situation and deal with it. They don't. So of course they're gonna cut you off, right? His mother, um, also disordered, says Angela was invested in him appearing normal. Uh-huh, and that too. She encouraged him to, to be normal to me as that held up the mask. Once she was dying, that mask, oop, that, uh, yeah. Oh, she helped hold up the mask, right. Totally makes sense. All right. I was barely three feet tall, maybe three or four years old. And I remember saying out loud, I would never do this to my children. Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Missed it. Wanted to know, had that beautiful long dark curly hair, hair until age five. And then mom chopped it off. Boy, hair washing was a little, little torture. Narcissistic mom trying to figure out. Yeah, and we should talk about narcissistic moms as it pertains to the survivor who is not a narcissist too, perhaps later this week. Um, he acted like he was terrified of her, but really I believe he was miserable. He probably was both. I think that they are terrified of, they're terrified of displeasing the mom. I mean, they are as much, so they have this, they have feelings, they have emotions, all right? They're not automatons with no emotions. They are human beings with emotions, narcissists, okay? They are. What they lack is empathy. And what they lack is the ability to have accountability for their own lives, for their for those emotions. So they are emotionally very small, but they still feel, okay? So yes, he was probably terrified like a little tiny child of his mother and doesn't have the ability to create the coping skills because he lacks the ability to have empathy for anyone but himself, which is an empathy, right? He lacks the ability to have empathy and also lacks the ability to have accountability for those emotions that he's feeling. Um, so he displaces them onto everyone else by hi and hiding them. And yeah, it, it's, it's the way they work and they are afraid of the mother. Um, hi, Kate, Kobe. They take, they bloodlet you and they let, have nothing left. They do. Uh, let's see. Do you think they know the dysfunction is going on with their moms? No, because they don't, even if they do, it doesn't matter because they don't have accountability. You see, without the ability to, let's change that word a second and find a different word for that. Without the acknowledgement, the no, the, understanding and choice. Okay, when we hear, okay, someone says to you, you're codependent, or if you realize I'm codependent, I realize where I got this. I was taught to people please. I was taught it's selfish to think of myself. I was taught that I'm supposed to give to everybody else. I had a narcissistic parent and they taught me that I had to be perfect. And that if I wasn't, then I wasn't good enough and all my self-worth, okay, when we see all this stuff, right? We think, now what? What do I do? How do I, I don't wanna live like this. How do I How do I fix this? And we go at it and we catch ourselves and we work this, this path, right? And we walk over the path, the path we need to walk to get to breaking free of that. Well, with them, they say, 
this is dysfunctional. Mom is mom's totally unreasonable. She doesn't even care. She never did love me. That didn't happen. That's not that. I, no, I'm perfect. She tells me I'm perfect and I'm going to believe that. And, and it's everybody else's fault. If, if they would stop making her mad, I wouldn't have to deal with blah, blah, blah. Or if, if this didn't happen, mom wouldn't act like that. Or, you know, they displace, they pretend they are delusional about, they don't take accountability. They don't take charge of their own life to heal and fix things. They bury it, pretend it isn't happening, or they project it onto other people and not just, or not, or. So yes, he probably does see it is dysfunctional, but no, he's probably not going to do anything about it ever. Probably can't. All right. Hello. Let's see. Uh, they are actors. Academy goes to malignant narcs. <laughs> when I met him, he seemed independent and strong. And when she moved in, it was like he reverted back to a child. Right. Because he had a mask on when you met him. Okay. He was pretending to be that so that you would, he would look that way in your eyes. My guess is he would probably be seeing you as a more maternal source versus a partner if that makes sense. I don't know. I don't know him, but I'm wondering how it, how it looked because to go from her you looking like the partner to her looking like the partner means he was projecting what he feels for her onto you when he first met you. And as soon as he had her back and around, he could place it back where it belongs in his mind, which is on her. It's sick. All right. Yes, I also had a mommy narc. She was expert at giving little positive sentiment. Build that hope of one day being enough and yank the pedestal out and splat. Totally worthless. Right. And some of us take it as worthless and others of us who are narcissists take it as the punishment needed in order to gain the place back of worthiness. And requiring of ador adoration, respect, and you know the requirements that the narcissist has. You see how it's set up with a narcissistic mom. All right. Okay, so my mother taught me it was selfish and bad to acknowledge my needs. Yes, yes, yes. It's taken me a long time to consider she may have been disordered to the extent that she was. <clears throat> now imagine if you had no empathy. So what you feel is she's right. I have no, I am not worth anything. Maybe you don't feel that, but someplace most of us who have had that drilled into our heads, we actually believe it, right? And so, But we see that it's a disordered belief. And so we go, huh, how can I fix that? What can I do to change it? Well, with a narcissist, imagine that you don't have, you don't think, what can I do to change it? You think, how can I make the world prove to me that's wrong? I go out there and force people to put me up on a pedestal. And if they don't give me the everything I want and desire, then I'm going to devalue them. And even if they do, I'm going to devalue them because if I devalue them, then, then I'm on top. I don't think they actually think it through like that, but that's what's happening. Right. I think it's just a natural. Oh, oh wait, something. I think it's just a natural uh, progression of how it works when you have an immature emotional system in play. All right. Um, Darla, emotional incest, if not incest. It is. I'm eating a basket of sweet potato to mitigate the bitter taste and the reflection upon mommy narcs. I know. I'm sorry. I understand. <laughs> Enjoy those. All right. I know things would have gotten much worse. I went back three days after I left and she had my stuff boxed up with my name on it. Uh-huh. Yep. She got you out and now she has them all to herself. Good. Let them. Let them. Let them. So I'm going to read something else. Somebody else wrote about this. I asked someone for some ideas because they lived through this with a narcissistic partner. And I asked them for like five things that seemed obvious to them. One was the narcissist needed the narcissist mom's permission to do anything. And the narcissist would never go against that mom and still won't. So... There's an enmeshment and it's like this person who won't let you even control how you feel. Like it will give you no control in, in the relationship, no equal even, right? Give you no control of your own, uh, like they steal our 
sense of, um, uh, of agency, right? Our own will to do things. That person gives complete control <laughs> over to a narcissistic parent. You can see it's just patterning, right? It's just following it. It's like an, a, a broken record. It's just a repeat. Okay. It's like bullies, right? Um, number two was narcissist mom enables the bad behavior. We talked about that. The narcissist mom almost encourages the bad behavior, not only enables, but definitely covers up for and pretends that the thing you may have a drug abusive narcissistic person and narcissistic mom pretends like there's no drugs involved. Oh, that was a long time ago. Oh, well, he's fine now or she's fine now. Oh, well, you know, I don't see any signs of that going on. Well, I'm here, so it's okay. You know? Yeah. So they need, I think that they need the narcissistic, they need the child. They need one of their children minimally to be at their service, right? They need their little footman, so to speak. They need the one that will do their bidding, that will be there no matter what, that will jump through the hoops for them. And in order to get that, they have to keep someone down. Well, the only one that's going to stay down and not run away are the absolute people pleasers who are completely buried under with it. Or someone like this, someone like a narcissist who has a need to fill their own ego so deeply through this relationship with their narcissistic parent, because they're, they're trauma bonded too to that narcissist. They are psychologically enmeshed more than that. Yeah, okay. I should have 10K subs, go get them, go promote it. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. <laughs> the guys are the best narc chats I've been on. Oh, that's sweet, thank you. I've done forms, okay. I'm glad that they are funny too. <laughs> That's just kind of the way it goes. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no serious around here. All right, I can be serious if I have to. But all right, but la, 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 la. my narcissist mother found another people pleaser. My sister, yes, they'll do that. They'll do that, and they'll knock someone down, and they'll pick someone else. I often wondered if they are trauma bonded to their mothers. Uh, I've been told yes by therapists. So I've been told, yes, that they can be trauma bonded. And yes, they would be trauma bonded in a narcissist, narcissist relationship. However, it would look different because it's not the people pleasing, fawning. They do fawn, but they fawn to get their position back. We fawn just to feel okay, just to feel like everything's okay. We get anxious and nervous because we just want everything to be happy and okay. We want to feel loved. They want to feel the power and the position that they have which they equate to feeling loved. So it's so much of life is in our intent, don't you think? In our intent behind why we do things, you can do the exact same thing and it's totally different intent and it has a totally different effect on everybody around you. Hence the narcissist. Okay, uh, number three, if the narcissist fell out of favor with a narcissistic mother, he would suddenly be super nice to me. We talked about that. Yeah, we talked about that in the beginning. Number four, I was a threat to the narcissist mom's superiority complex. And there you have it. She packed your boxes and she had them labeled. She not only packed you, she had it labeled. Super controlling, right? She put you in a box with your name on it. That's who you were. Out. Mine. That's what she was saying. Get out of my position. You do not have power here. I have the power. Eh, it's icky. Okay. Do you think deep down they are miserable? Oh, yeah, of course. All narcissists are miserable deep down. Yes. I think they're miserable deep down because deep down is all the, okay, if you buried every piece of your life that you needed to be accountable for, would you be happy ever? No, you wouldn't. You couldn't be because it's all in there. We can't escape our subconscious. We can't escape our ego. We can't escape it. We can try to live a life that isn't based on those things, right? We can try to live a life that isn't based on our trauma, that isn't based on all the things we feel about ourselves and all the negativity by shifting the way we think and gaining perspective in our life and trying to act more from consciousness rather than, than uh, the ego, but, and from a place of love and a place of kindness. 
But a narcissist can't do that. Then why would they do that? Why would everything is transactional to them? Love is transactional to them. So it's, it's, I will give you this if you give me that. And you can see how, when you look at these relationships with a narcissistic mother, how that's set up. You may be the golden child as long as there are rules. They're unspoken, but there are definite criteria. And that narcissist who's the golden child, son or daughter, knows exactly what the rules are. And they know how to play it. And so they do. Yep. And I think they deliberately fall off the pedestal sometimes too, just to get a break. <laughs> I do. All right. Um, I wonder if he got away from her, if he would want our relationship back. I hope not. I hope that you by that time have found your strength to stay away. Okay. Because this is never going to be a safe and healthy person. If he's a narcissist at all. All right. This person is someone who has many, 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 many years of their own work to do in order to be healthy for another person if they're not a narcissist, if he's that in, that entangled with his mother, right? <clears throat> and that easily drawn into being abusive to you because of his mother. It's different than when a survivor who is not narcissistic is codependent with their parent and they have a partner who's not a narcissist. Yes, it puts a strain on the relationship. Yes, it isn't fair to their partner. But that person is not coming to their partner and dumping all the abuse, flipping the script and dumping it and projecting it onto their partner a little bit, because we all do it a little bit, but not to the degree a narcissistic person does. So if he wants back, I'm hoping by that time you are ready to uh, ready to see that this isn't something healthy for you. And you can get on with you. Okay, because the whole point is our focus forward, not looking at them constantly. I like to do these once in a while where we look at them, but mostly they're not important. We're only important for understanding, not for how to live with, because they're not good to live with. All right. Um, what do you think the correlation is between narcissist mother and son enmeshment? It's exactly what I've been talking about. It's that it's a power play. It's inner, it's transactional transactional relationship. I give, I will give you this if you give me that. And the poor child, which they are, I mean, they were a child of a narcissist. So in one sense, yes, there is a sad element to that, right? We don't all become that though. <laughs> we don't all become that ourselves and project it onto the rest of our life and flip scripts and, and, and abuse other people because of it. They do. So I lose my empathy there for them. I lose my ability to have much empathy. Let's put it that way um, for them because they're not doing anything to better their lives. If you're not doing anything to better your life, no one can help you. Not even you, not the most loving person can help you. You can't, it just doesn't. All it is is you feed off it, right? If you're a narcissist in particular. So the enmeshment is, is it's the power play. It's the it's, it's the nature of the relationship with a narcissistic parent. There has to be enmeshment. They need the control. And the narcissistic child likes that because they understand transactional relationship. They understand it. That's how they think. They think that way too. If you could be transactional with them, it'd be fine. You would just feel empty and disgusting. But you see, you get used to the ups and downs and it's all transactional with a narcissist. It's, um, you will give me love, respect and worship and I will give you touch and kindness. This for that, everything, tit for tat, always. So it's just the same thing, only it's two of them. All right. <clears throat> Both parents of my ex are narcissists. He was kind to me when they were around. He became protective of me, really strange. And that I have seen too and potentially experienced. I don't know that his parents, I believe one of them might be, but a very, very well hidden covert. That would happen because what they're doing is they're showing you off like a pet. They're showing how good they can take care of their pet to their narcissistic parent who is in constant disapproval of them. So they're, they're treating you in a way and very protectively and very as an object to, sh to prove to the world that they are a good person, blah, 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 whatever they're trying to prove. Whoever they are, they're gonna have their own thing they're trying to prove, right? But yeah, it's, it's a game and it's so, oh my gosh, doesn't it feel disgusting, Angela? Doesn't it feel disgusting when somebody who is so 
devaluing, even if they never say an unkind, so to speak, word, even if it's all covert and it's all just this constant disapproval of you, the constant feeling of never being enough around that narcissist. And then they get around their parents and suddenly you are the light that shines out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like suddenly you are the sunshine of the world and you, and they protect you and they, oh, isn't it gross to see? Oh, I can remember that. It is so icky feeling. And you're sitting there going, I wish their parents were always around. And then also at the same time, like, ick, what is happening? What's happening? Right. They were the meanest, creepy people I've ever met. Ew. Okay. Makes you want to take a shower, doesn't it? I just took one too. Dang it. All right. Okay. So another one here. Let's see. Butting heads with a narcissist mong made my life a hundred times worse. Vindictive, no reason to be nice to me. I was a threat to her supply. I was a threat to her supply. So being vindictive, being butting heads, meaning forcing my narcissist mom to be accountable for her, her piece in this, forcing her to say something truthful, or it's forcing meaning not, not backing down with boundaries with the narcissistic mother created more trouble because then she'd play it out most likely through her son or her daughter. In this case, it was a son. And she'd play it out by making the supply look like the crazy one. And by forcing it, to, it, it can become where you're having a reactive abuse type of reaction toward the narcissistic mother or towards the narcissist, you become, you've got two narcissists acting as one when you are a partner with these people, when, that's, when this is going on. Just imagine that, like close your eyes for three seconds and then open them really fast and be glad you're not there <laughs> because it's, yeah, it's compounded, not double. It's like a hundred times is what, like she said. It's not just the double compounding of, of, oh my gosh, these people are crazy. It's like a hundred times the weight of it coming at you. So it's a bad place. Yeah. She has them all to herself. Mother's happy. Let them be happy. They're not happy. They're in a, they're in a constant dance of toxicity. That's not happiness. Let them be. Let them have it. You don't want to dance. Don't put your foot into that room and go dancing with them or him. It's not worth it. It's not going to, it's not going to change. All right. They used to gang up on me and try and act like they were joking. Yep. That's the triangulation. And that's the, what we were talking about earlier, where they gather their forces and turn on someone. They're bullies. They literally bully and pick on you. Uh-huh. Because they need to have a scapegoat. You become the scapegoat. Don't want to live your life as a scapegoat right? Oh my God, they're always at their service. As you say, I was their validating listening ear. Yes. As a result, they would often say, we never have to worry about you. We don't want to hear your problems, just ours. Uh, yeah. All right. Swimming in a cesspool of narcissists most of my life. It's icky. Yeah. But at least you've got resources now, right? And and you see that that's not the only thing that exists. And that is a step. My mommy narc used to um, use the family pet for triangulation. I only dreamed of being treated as good as the dog. That too. <laughs> yes, with the pets, they do it. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. I ne never thought of being a scapegoat saying, Darla, <coughs> excuse me, I got... <clears throat> unavailable to talk. All right. But that makes sense. They were definitely big bullies. Yeah. They need to have a scapegoat. It feels good to them. I think they get a, they get a kick out of that um, sort of, well, extremely sadistic treatment of other people, right? Especially the higher up on the spectrum they are. And when you have two together, it, I mean, two wrongs make a right in that kind of case, right? It makes it feel good to them. It's just like, it's like um, like any hazing or bullying or anything like that. When you get more than one bully in a room, 
you that that's what rules the room. That's why you got to watch your influences and be careful who you're around and make sure that this is a situation that speaks to your own boundaries and your own safety and your own well being. It's not worth it. It's not you. It's them. They will do it to anyone who will stay. Anyone. And not you. That's why it's up to us to get away. It's up to us to put that block on there and to not talk to them, to not look at them, to not pay attention to them, to not feed them any ounce of supply. It's up to us, right? Because we're the ones that have to realize we're worth more. They will continue to do it to anyone who lets them. So that's just the nature of how the narcissist works. All right. Mine dropped me from the insurance, but kept the pet insurance. <sighs> okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. All right. What else is here? Um, sometimes they will act like I asked a couple people about this as well, who have experienced this. Did they act? Did the narcissist act like they were super annoyed? Like they completely couldn't stand their mother. Like mother was the worst. Like oh, we know how she is and blah, blah, blah. And like, and, and then, and then, and then, and then after you agree and after you're feeling like there's some connection back with your partner, who is the narcissist, they run to mommy and triangulate. Okay. Yes. He treated mommy's dog better than me. Yep. That was the only time I ever seen any empathy from him. That's not empathy. That's not empathy. That's stealing supply from an animal. It's not empathy. Treating an animal well is not empathy. It's not. It's a piece of care for something else that does not equal empathy. Empathy is being able to put yourself in the position of another being, our planet, a person, something. Being able to put yourself in the condition, not in an enmeshed, not in a way necessarily of like a codependent way where you need to fix it, but you truly feel it. Okay, you truly experience, you feel, you understand from that level what the other being is going through. Being able to take care of a dog is not empathy. That's just basic animal care. And showing it cutesy, cutesy love gets affection back. Dogs are cute. It's not like doing that to a lizard, right? And even if they did it to a lizard, that would be for funny sake or for like, because that's the only amount of emotion they can handle coming at them is the stare of a lizard, right? But it's not, that's not empathy. That's, it, it looks like it because we're grasping for anything. We're grasping for anything to make them seem more human. But it isn't. Okay. I had a friend who came from a family where the father ignored his daughters but loved his dogs. Yeah. Uh-huh. Angela, that is just horrible. You were dropped from the health insurance. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, stealing supply from an animal. Okay, uh, Bonnie saying my narcissist loves to show, oh, the dog so loves him. Oh yeah, look at this dog loves me. They like the control too. Dogs are great for narcissistic supply because a dog is trainable. A dog is loyal. A dog is, doesn't, you can kick a dog. Not that I would want anyone to do that, but, and the dog will still remain at your side. In fact, that dog will cower and bow down to you. Yay, right? that's a dog. That's a dog. Dogs are extremely attached to their owners most of the time, to their caregivers, to whatever you want to call them, their, their parent, their, their human. They're attached to their people. And most dogs, unless abused in certain ways, and not that they're all animal abusers and narcissists, but even, even if that's the case, the dog won't run and, and leave. The dog will be as trauma bonded in a, in a sense to that abusive person. Now, if, a, if they're not abusive and they're super, but they are controlling, they love to control. They love to get them to do tricks and to do the controlling. Yeah. So do other people, but the way they do it is to get, this, it's like, look how powerful I am. Look at this. Amount, amount of command I have over this animal. Look how much it loves me and only me. I'm the special one. Uh, okay. I love these dogs so much. I thought, okay, I have expensive prescriptions. Uh, I can write. 
<coughs> excuse me. Stealing supply from an animal, truly sad. Yes, it is. Well, they take supply from everything. It's just the way they're, they're black holes trying to be filled. They're vacuous. They empty everything around them. Everything around them is emptied. <clears throat> They'll often fill their life with stuff, right? So that the emptying isn't feel so empty. Uh, okay. Yep. All right. All right, you guys, anything else about this this topic with the narcissist mom and the son or daughter? We're doing son because that's what was asked for, but could be applied to a daughter as well, as long as they're a narcissist too, because that's what we're talking about. Um, anything else that you want to talk? Or is anything going on? We're almost at the end here because we're almost to an hour. So anything you anyone needs help with or any topics for later this week or for next week, hit me up. Let me know, and we'll go there. We need to cleanse our palate a little here, because now I'm all, uh, just talked about narcissists. <laughs> so what's going on with you guys? Let's switch it over. What's happening? What's happening? Anything good and lovely happening in your life that you want to talk about? Anything you need help with that you want to talk about? Start typing. Type it, type it. Come on. <laughs> Help me out. I'm going to change my head, my head before we get out of here. You know, I was thinking about, um, how, how can I say this? Wait, read the last of my comment. It's funny. Okay, Angela, let me find you. Let me find it. Let me find it. I had a friend who came from a family where the father ignored his daughters but loved his dogs. This is Angela's comment. The daughters bought t-shirts for the dogs that said, my daddy loves me just the way I am. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we can't find humor. What is there, right? <laughs> Gotta find humor. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, Bonnie, your kitty, I'm sorry. I hope you can enjoy time with your kitty while you have your kitty, because that's very sad. Um, sometimes the dog acted terrified of him. Other times it almost seemed like the dog was trauma bonded to him. Yep, exactly. My Mine's dog was so, I don't even know what to call it. It looked like well-trained. She couldn't even go outside to go to the bathroom without me standing next to her telling her it was okay to go to the bathroom. She couldn't, like, she wouldn't do anything wrong. It, it reminded me of, uh, of, a, of a child that's being forced to be a perfectionist that already has a perfectionist nature, you know, that already has that quiet sort of prim nature about them reminded me of seeing a child like that or seeing an adult who was a child like that. Um, and the stress, like she slept all the time. She's depressed. And oh, so I would like to like get her to do naughty things. <laughs> you want some cookies off the table? <laughs> some, you want a piece of meat off my plate? <laughs> you know, I just wanted her to do naughty things so she'd act like an animal for a little bit, you know, not that I wanted her in trouble, but it was like, I felt so like she was just, and as I saw that, I realized that's what was happening to me. I could see the whole thing playing out through the way the dog behaved. Uh, yeah, actually makes me want to cry for the dog right now because <laughs> she's still living it, I'm sure, but okay. Um, so sick and twisted to the point of laughable, how triangulation with animals is being used in society today. It is, it's laughable and sad, right? It's life affirming to be naughty. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> as long as you're not hurting anyone and you're being safe, sane and legal, there you go, right? <laughs> um, if I said it, it would have to be its own video. Oh no, Shastina, hugs. I don't know what to offer you there, but you're not alone, right? Narcs triangulate people, animals, children, et cetera. They triangulate situations. They triangulate everything they can. They, they, it's like having backup. They need someone, need someone behind them because they're like, they need the big 
heavyweight behind them, right? Light bulb moment. I used to ask to come in from playing to use the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the pup. Yeah. The control. Oh, it's awful. Okay. I'm not expect anything from that narc. Good. Ex try and work on you, Bonnie. Here's the point. They are nothing but black holes. Okay. They're going to, they literally suck your soul. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was listening to a book called Untethered Soul. Okay. And I'm only partway through, and this would be a really long discussion. And when I'm done with it, I may do something with it because it's fascinating and it is so good. And I could relate it all to our experience with how we behave in a situation, how a narcissist behaves in a situation. Anyway, I was thinking about it in the terms of how they um, use us. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to spit this out today. I may have to think on it a little more. But basically, it, it goes, they want more than just, they want everything. They want all of it from you. They go, it goes all the way down to your consciousness is what they're trying to take. Okay, beyond your the way you act, beyond the emotions that you feel, deeper, 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 they want to bore into you and steal that light that you have that is who you actually are. And that's why we don't know who we are when we come out of this. And I am not explaining this well, but you can see I mean something. <laughs> I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to like chew on it and get words and do a whole talk on it because it, it blew my mind when I saw it like this, that they literally want all the way in. And that's what they're after. They're after that light. Okay. They're after the piece of you that is who you really are because they don't have it. And they don't have it because they have it. They just won't see it. They won't get there because it takes going through shedding of belief that you are what you feel belief that you are what you think. You know what I mean? Like those are just pieces of who we are. What we are is like deep underneath it. And that's what they're after. And they, and they come in and then we don't even know what the outer pieces are anymore. We don't know what we think and what we feel. And, and we lose who we are. We lose sight of, of all of it. And I'm totally rambling, but it makes sense in my head. <laughs> anyway, going to go back to light stealers. Yeah. Back to this topic. They rob you of you. Yeah, you guys get it, right? You get it even though I'm not really making a whole lot of sense and I'm speaking a little esoterically because I don't know how to talk about this. <sighs> Untethering isn't easy for the narcissist. They, they, have so, they have the same consciousness we have according to, you know, I mean, they just don't have empathy. They don't have, they have, they can't get there because the only way to untether, the only way to like, be who you really are authentically is to not believe when you're sad that that's all there is. It's to not believe that the programming that you were taught is real, right? It's to truly live your life authentically means I'm just here. That's all I am. I'm here as I am. And I have this personality. Yes, but that's not all of who I am, right? And there's more inside. They can't get there because they're so addicted and so attached to their ego. So instead they pull it out of everybody else. So you're just like left flat and drained. Anyway, I don't even know how to talk about that, but it's a, it's an awesome topic. I just got to get right words. Okay, they need backup. It's the key and massive red flag. You are wonderful. Thank you. Um, the learning never stops. The learning never stops for me. I think that's probably why <laughs> I'm always like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Okay, vampires in our it truly is. It's literally vampiric of your soul. I mean, I, I'm going to have to get the right words for this because when I, it was like this huge, I mean, I understood this, right? But it was like this huge connection between why it happens and how it happens. And it's literal. Yeah. Okay. The narcissist totally engulfs its prey to devour it, all of it. Nothing left but an empty shell. Except, Mo Cowboy, there is something left. There's the spark, right? There's the hope. There's who you really are. You're in there. That's the thing. They don't, they don't, they can't empty us because we are endless vessels of containment of good energy. We're energy, right? We are 
everybody's energy, but we don't block the flow of it from connection. You know, we we're open to change. We're open to working with these things. And, but on another level, it, they can't suck, take it all because there isn't, it's, it's infinite, right? Our, our, who we really are is not, it's not a thing that you can like take away or where would we go? We're still in there. It's just, they cover you over, right? What did you say? They hold on top your soul. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's a whole nother topic, but it's, it's fascinating. All right. It can always be tapped into by ourselves. Right. And that's why self-care and that's why self-focus is important. It, the more focus you pour into a toxic person, the less you have energy for yourself and the less you have energy for your healing. They take an enormous amount of energy. They're like, they take, because they are, you're, you're shining your light for yourself and you're shining light for someone else. Imagine just that metaphor, how much energy that would burn. There's nothing left for self then. <laughs> There's nothing left because you're pouring it out and they take tons, right? So they keep a heavy boot on your head. Yeah. Have you seen that meme with the, the boot on the kid's head and he's like making a face and then it pulls back and it's, he's holding the boot on his own head. I feel like we do that to ourselves when we leave by keeping the connection and the focus back on the narcissist. That's why I'm saying like this topic was interesting today and it's important to understand. And then we got to let it go and move on because they're not as important as they think they are. <laughs> All right. They're not, we need to focus on our own importance and healing and realize that it doesn't matter if they'd take us back. We're not going back. Okay. And, and when, if we can't get out, we find ways to fix our um, ability to have care for ourselves and our, our beliefs about ourselves. And the boundaries will start coming up. And as the boundaries come up, then things change. And, and hopefully you can find your way out. Right. Okay. You guys, I'm going to head out of here. Anything you want for tomorrow to talk about? Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday. Wednesday, not a good day for this. Thursday, I'll be coming on probably after Angie and Dana. So later in the day. Um, anything you want to talk about, let me know. You can always put it in any comment of any video and I write them down and try and get to them as I can. Um, it does feel good to give to people that appreciate and grow positive in this world, doesn't it? Yes. Hello world. Hello world. How are you? They force you to carry their burden. You're bearing two crosses, yours and theirs. Yep. They do. They do. And we take it. And why do we take it? Because we like to help people. We like to, we think that that's what we're supposed to do. Like there's lots of reasons why we take that burden. <sighs> And it's forced upon you because otherwise they will devalue you and blah, blah, blah. So they usually do come on Tuesdays. I think they're doing a different day this week. So um, what I meant by that was I'll be on later in the day, most likely on Thursday, not in the morning. So um, permission to exist says they can detach each other. Kira is saying um, instantly and will respect each other's territory. Okay. All right, you guys. Anything else um, that you want to talk about for later this week? Let me know Thursday or Friday. Uh, I think that's it. If you need text notification or would like text notification, that would be a really strange need. <laughs> I need it. Um, text me at 33222. Put the word lease live, L-I-S-E-L-I-V-E, -E, one word, hit send, and I will send you a text notification prior to going live by about 10 minutes. Um, if you have not done so, hit subscribe. If you have not done so, hit the thumbs up. Um, what else? What else? I can be found at queenbeing.com if you have any coaching needs or you, um, I'm over there. The link is in the main description of every video. If you have any need for anything regarding narcissistic abuse, if you're looking for peer support, anything like that, again, queenbeing.com has all the information that you could possibly want and it is continually being poured into with more information. So there's that. And I think that's it. If you need information on group coaching, it is continual. You can join anytime. It does technically begin at the beginning of every month, but it doesn't matter when you join. I just prorate the months 
into the next month so that you get your amount of weeks that you uh, paid for. And um, the information is in the description of videos as well. Yeah, but currently there is Wednesdays, Wednesday evening, uh, Wednesday afternoon, evening, and Friday morning Pacific time groups going on. And it's pretty active and they're a pretty good group. Actually, they're an awesome group. I mean, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. They're awesome. <laughs> Amazing people. Lucky, lucky me. Okay. All right, you guys, I will head out. I will see you Thursday. You have a lovely Wednesday and a lovely evening. Talk to you later. Goodbye, my friends.